Okay, well, welcome again, everybody. Um, this is OSF Institution's case study, collaborating on open science at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, we're very happy to have our panelists here today. My name is Gretchen Gagan. I work at the Center for Open Science. Um, we're hosting this today and, um, and run the open OSF platform. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Um, as um, uh, attendees, you have the option to put questions in a Q&A tool, which you'll see in the, the Zoom tools at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'd appreciate it if you put questions there that, that you want to have answered, um, because that way we can make sure we see them and we can put a response and the response will stay with the question. And as the um, uh, program goes along, you can look at that to see questions that are answered and you can look and see the answered questions um, in case you had them as well. We'll keep the chat reserved for chat. So, you know, uh, comments, if you wanna introduce yourself, if you wanna, um, you know, uh, give a plus one um, to anything that anyone's saying, that's what we'll use the chat for today. Um, and we are gonna do a quick little poll just uh, here at the start. Teresa can bring that up. This will only take a few seconds. Um, we like to do this to get a sense of amongst our attendees, um, how familiar you are with OSF, um, if you've made an OSF account, things like that, um, just for keeping track of how we're doing in terms of getting to the right audience with these um, webinars. Um, so maybe leave that up for a little uh, second. And in the interim, I will go ahead and hand things over to Ben Gorham from Case Western University. Ben is going to be facilitating our session today. Um, I, my, I will still be on the line helping out with questions um, and any logistics, but Ben is going to take, uh, take it over and uh, introduce our panelists. All right. Thank you so much, Gretchen. Um, I am uh, Ben Gorham. I'm the research data and GIS specialist over at Case Western Reserve University, and I serve also as our kind of unofficial OSF for institutions uh, administrator here. So I have a lot of a lot of time spent working with open science, open publishing, open scholarship, open education, all of the open things, and uh, pushing them out, dealing with digital scholarship. And so I'm really excited to chat with our panelists today and hear how it happens over at CMU. Um, I will let the panelists introduce themselves in order of view on my screen, so we can start with Melanie, if you would. Sure, thank you. Uh, my name is Melanie Ganey. I'm a STEM librarian at Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. I'm also the director of our Open Science and Data Collaborations program, and I'm one of our OSF administrators as well. Thank you. Great, thanks, Melanie. Next up, I see Saeed. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Saeed Choudhury, the Assistant Dean for Digital Infrastructure and Director of the Open Source Programs Office at Carnegie Mellon University. All right, thank you. And last but not least, Nikki. Hi, Nikki Agate. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Engagement at Carnegie Mellon University and have the great honor of working with these two and lots of other of our wonderful faculty and staff as well. All right, wonderful, thank you all. So I believe we can jump into what brought us all here today. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. You know, I'm really delighted to be part of this conversation uh, as someone who engages with the open science framework, research data management, issues of open access, publishing, scholarship frequently at my own institution. Um, I know I've had my own complicated trajectory and my institution has had its own complicated trajectory um, pursuing these kinds of initiatives. And I'm sure many folks in the audience here have as well. So I'd like to get our, our question started today by learning from all of you um, how your programs came to be. What are they? How did they come to be? How did you get started with these initiatives? Uh, and how did you end up where you are now? And we can, you know, take it away as you see fit, panelists. Sure. So if we start chronologically, I'll kick this off. <laughs> so um, back in 2017, there were a few of us liaisons who were supporting the life science departments at Carnegie Mellon. So myself, uh, my colleague, Swajin Wong, and Anna Von Gulick, who's currently at Figshare. Um, and we had a couple of goals in mind at that time. We wanted to think about open science support for the entire research workflow. So at that time, um, 
We did have open science support, but it was really focused on the end of the life cycle. So we had an APC fund. We had um, an institutional repository, which had recently launched at that time. We had support for ORCID IDs, et cetera. And this was mostly framed as, you know, open access and data sharing support. Um, and so that was one goal we had. And another was that we really wanted to be able to foster conversations on open science across disciplines on campus. So get people together to talk about what are the opportunities and challenges of open science and to learn from one another, both the researchers and us in the libraries. Um, so to that end, we started creating services to help us achieve these goals. And one of the first initiatives we had was the first Open Science Symposium in 2018, which brought together people for those conversations. Um, another was getting our institutional license for Open Science Framework, which does support open science across the research workflow. Um, we were very lucky to have a lot of support from our dean, Keith Webster, who's been a big champion of open science for a long time now. And he really gave us the um, freedom to, you know, pursue these interests and build the services. And we codified those um, collection of services into the Open Science and Data Collaborations Program in 2018. Um, so with that, I'll hand over to Saeed to talk about the OSPO. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, and I just want to pick up on the point you made about Keith. Um, my understanding is he was thinking about open science when he was part of the UK government. Uh, decades ago. So this is a long-term trajectory. And I'm just being very candid that one of the reasons I wanted to come to CMU was to join that trajectory. <laughs> um, I feel that uh, as an institution, clearly CMU has been thinking about this, building a program, uh, being very strategic about this uh, and proactive. So all of that was very appealing to me. And in particular, uh, as Melanie mentioned, I lead what's called the Open Source Programs Office or OSPO which is a fairly new concept in the university sector. Uh, these offices have been around in the private sector for some time, but more recently we're starting to see a group of these OSPOs being formed uh, at multiple universities and Carnegie Mellon was certainly one of the earliest uh, in that wave. Uh, and an OSPO basically is, as you might imagine, focused on better ways to identify, manage, curate, share, and reuse uh, software, particularly open source software. And I believe that we as a community have spent a lot of time and effort on looking at open access uh, of articles, um, a fair amount on, on, on open data, but not maybe as much around open source software. And given the critical role it plays in digital infrastructure, uh, it's time in some ways to really be intentional and dedicate and a dedicated effort and strategy around uh, open source software as a part of an open science program. So it, it really is in alignment with a lot of things that Melanie and I'm sure Nikki will mention now, um, but we have a dedicated focus on open source software that I think is uh, pretty important. Great, thank you, Nikki. So I'm the, I'm the newest member of the team. So I guess chronologically we are, <laughs> we are still going here. I joined Carnegie Mellon last summer um, and like Saeed, you know, having sort of been a long advocate for open myself was really impressed by the strength and the reputation um, of the open science program and the support from the dean, which is not always, you know, I've seen open science programs and in other institutions where it's sort of one person trying to do all the things and the dean's like, you're that person, I don't need to think about it. And it feels really important that it's that it's sort of protected um, at the institution. One of the things since, since I've come along is we've been trying to th think about how do we bring back um, those parts of the research life cycle that um, Melanie was talking about earlier, sort of we had the open access repository and we had the the sort of ORCID and all the rest of it. And then how do we bring all of that into this broader sort of idea of, of openness at CMU? So not just the data and the data sharing, but, you know, Melanie and one of her colleagues, Sarah, working on open evidence synthesis, for example. We have a burgeoning open educational resources program. We have just um, adopted two parts of publishing from the university and are going to have a broad open publishing mandate. And so sort of trying to think about how to move all of these things together rather than separately in their own. Uh, Carnegie Mellon's really good at fiefdoms. We're trying not to have many fiefdoms within, within open, within the libraries. I think the other thing I would add is just... Um, for me, you know, I'm I'm trained as a humanist, and 
I've spent a lot of my career trying to help people think about how to foster open science principles at the beginning of a digital humanities project. So thinking about reproducibility, accessibility, discoverability, all of those things. And so this seemed like a really good opportunity to sort of get in there at the ground and make sure that we're representing the whole campus. That's great. Thank you. I think you're already touching on a lot of the big themes and, and follow-up questions that we're going to have. This is great. Um, I had one little follow-up uh, just, just right away for, for Saeed. Um, the, the question of open source software that is, you know, it's so important for a lot of this open ecosystem. But I, I wonder, do you encounter, have you encountered pushback from entrenched researchers, people with preferred or baked in tools, where it's difficult to kind of get over that threshold into, into open source buy-in? Uh, short answer is no, but I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you some more context than just answering that way. Uh, so true, true story, when I started at Carnegie Mellon, which is August of 2022, um, I spoke with Keith and said, give me three months or so to socialize this concept and try to get a lay of the land and start the persuasion, the nudging, you know, the, 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 the in, you know, sort of dealing with potentially the resistance or the friction that you described in your question. And he smiled and he said, sure, that's fine. And then about three weeks into my term, I was talking to a faculty member uh, who was listening very patiently. And then about, I don't know, seven, eight minutes <laughs> into my spiel said, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I'm going to interrupt you. And, and I was a little anxious that, oh my goodness, what have I done? This is not going, going to go well. And he said, I know why you're doing this, but don't. Everyone at CMU gets this. Uh, we, we all believe in open source. We want to make open source work. Move right to the what can you do for us? <laughs> you, don't, you don't need to persuade me. And I kept thinking this must be one data point, but I, I will say I've been struck by just how, pardon the pun, uh, open is, uh, you know, open everyone is at CMU to open source software. It is a wash in open source software. Um, you know, I, uh, it's important to mention that at the OSPO, we do not go around saying you must use open source software. Um, but I will say that I've, I've not had that kind of resistance. Um, even people using proprietary tools, potentially building proprietary tools will tell you, we know there's a place for open source software, may not work for our particular context. Um, or how do we migrate from a closed system to an open one, which is really important in the context of Cloud Lab, which I know is something we'll wanna talk about uh, during this session. But I, I also think more broadly speaking, because I, I don't want this to be just bragging about CMU, um, I, I will say the, the, the social norms around open source software are very different than they are around data and articles, um, where you have existing kinds of infrastructure and ecosystems and players. Um, the, the irony is that the private sector in the last decade or so has done a lot to foster openness around software with licenses and, and engineering practices and so on. Uh, faculty are much more willing to quite frankly share their software and put it out on a public repository than they might be you know, with their data or they may be able to do with their articles given agreements. So there are some social norms and some factors and characteristics about software that I, make it, I think it make it more amenable uh, to, to supporting open science regardless of institution. Um, and the other thing I'll, I'll end with is it's everywhere in software, right? The most recent analysis said that 95% of all software has open source in it, and about 75 to 80% of all software code bases are open source. That's great. It's a great place to be. Um, well, you, you kind of uh, mentioned Cloud Lab already, so we, we wanted to ask a little bit about some of these ex the examples of how your collaborations are meeting the needs of, of open science at CMU. You know, do you have examples of collaborative work, collaborative initiatives that you or your colleagues have been engaged in for the advancement of open science, open scholarship, open access, et cetera. Any, any examples of those collaborations that you could share with us? Sure, um, I'll start. Um, so again, uh, going back to Keith Webster, we were really lucky to get in very early in those conversations with the Cloud Lab um, through his introductions facilitation. And so the Cloud Lab just formally opened this past month, but we've been working with uh, CMU Cloud Lab for three years now to see how we can help open up the research coming out of that. And so for anyone who's not aware of the Cloud Lab, it's the um, first automated life science lab in an academic institution. 
Um, so researchers just put in lines of code into their computer and then robots assisted by human technicians do the experiments in a facility in Pittsburgh. Um, and so from those early conversations, we knew that it was going to be important that people be able to share any data that was coming off the cloud lab. A lot of these researchers do have NIH funding and we knew the policy was going to be changing. So um, we've done some work to help prepare them for that. So, um, you know, we've have created uh, customized DMSP templates for them to use. And we are now working on um, creating an integration between the Cloud Lab databases and our institutional repository, KillTub, which is built on Figshare, so that a user could really easily send data um, from the Cloud Lab to the repository with just a few lines of code and at the same time auto populate um, some of the sections of the README documentation. Um, and then we're also creating just some you know, basic introductory um, training modules for them as well uh, that really highlight the value of reproducibility both in a wet lab and computational context. Um, and I think one challenge we're kind of aware of and we're doing some work now to see how we might help is that to use the Cloud Lab, you do have to write code. Um, so that can be a bit of a barrier for people that have are not used to writing code or have any computational experience. At the same time, CMU Libraries does do a lot of work to help build confidence in these computational skills with um, foundational workshops and things like Python R and command line. And so I think one thing we'll be exploring, is there a way to ease the barrier of entry um, to researchers who are not used to thinking about how to do things programmatically? That's very cool. Yeah, and, and I'll, 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 I'll build on that. And again, I, I when I say build on it, Melanie and Wajin, did a lot of really great early work with Cloud Lab that again I was able to build on as soon as I arrived at CMU. Uh, one thing I, I don't don't know if Melanie mentioned this is uh, the original Cloud Lab was built by two CMU uh, alumni uh, through Emerald Cloud Lab is the name of their company. It was built for Bay Area startup companies, and as you can imagine, those companies do not want to share with each other for obvious reasons. So we we went from a system that was designed to be partitioned, closed, however you want to think about it to the university environment where obviously we don't want that uh, and we want it to be open. And I know that the Emerald Cloud Lab team came to CMU and conducted a lot of interviews with labs, uh, potential users of the system and heard from everybody. Of course, we want to share. You know, we wanted this to be open. So that's been an interesting journey, right? Going from the system that was closed and proprietary to opening it up, so to speak. And Melanie mentioned this integration between you know, Cloud Lab and, and Figshare or you know, CMU's institutional repository, and Figshare being one of those generalist repositories that NIH identifies. That conversation basically, you know, the first reactions when I spoke to some of the business development people, the legal people, was, what are you talking about? You want to open everything up? <laughs> this is not how we operate. And when we said, well, if you want NIH funding, <laughs> then you can't just say, it's a closed system, nobody can get to the data. And then when we explained that there are these institutional repositories of these generalist repositories, and then a whole host of NIH data specific repositories. And having that kind of systematic integration would obviously make it more appealing to NIH in terms of data management plan supports and so on. They, they said, okay, we get that. And they made a decision to, you know, release their software for the platform. Now, you know, they said they've open sourced it and we can debate, you know, whether that's truly open source or not, but it's certainly a step in that direction. Um, and the, the 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 final point I make is that uh, I had the great privilege of working with people like Carol Palmer and Chris Borgman, the information science community, who talk about these curation thresholds where you can get people to behave in a way that's conducive to creating metadata or supporting open science. And the role of an instrument for a community, like if you think about astronomers with a large telescope, you don't get to show up at the end of that process and say, no, I'm not going to use the data standard. No, I'm not going to use the protocols. But if you think about the disciplines supporting, you know, supported by Cloud Lab, it tends to be very small, sort of idiosyncratic, even proprietary tools. But Cloud Lab is giving us a chance to think about that more systematically, right, from an infrastructure perspective. So whatever we do in terms of openness, whether it's data, code, hardware, uh, will now cascade throughout that entire system in a systematic way. So I think that's a really exciting opportunity. I can just add in that um, some of the work we've been doing 
internally is sort of trying to think about um, better supporting obviously all of the federal mandates that are coming out, but in a way that will also support um, our communities on campus. You know, there was the the new NSF requirements for mentoring, I think go live as of this week, um, where all, all graduate students and postdocs are going to have to have a mentoring plan that's written into the grant. And so several of our colleagues in the broader open at CMU sphere have um, come up with the Tartan Research Data Ambassador Program that they're going to be launching in the fall, where they're going to invite representatives from individual labs and centers, of which we have many, many at CMU, to sort of come together and be their sort of ambassadors or, or um, liaisons to the other faculty and researchers in, in their units about all of these changes, about open science and open sharing practices in general. And so we're pretty excited to sort of see that as a cohort model where those people can learn and support, learn from each other and support each other and also have a way to meet folks outside of their own disciplines or their own labs, which as we all know, can be a little difficult sometimes if you're sort of in the zone. Um, we're also, I, th I think the other thing I would say is that the new publishing initiative is offers a lot. So we already had a library publishing program. We use Janeway open source software. Um, the Entertainment Technology Center, who's ma who, which is a program where master students build video games, mostly, um, they had a press as well. That's come under us. But there's a lot of interesting opportunities there to think about publishing games, public, like bringing together all of these more multimodal aspects of that. And then we have the CMU Press, which will, which is much more traditional, has some really award-winning poets and things like that. But how can we begin to bring those into conversation with the kind of multimodal work that's going on in the School of Design and thinking about those publications? So we're excited there too, just to see how all of these sort of undergirded by, by open, open infrastructure. In many ways, I want the open to be the default and almost not need to be talked about because it's the engine or whatever the infrastructure that's making this thing go along. That's great, thank you. Any other, uh, anything else anyone would like to add uh, to this question of how are these collaborations meeting the needs, any examples you'd like to bring up? We can move on. Okay. Well, you've, you've mentioned this uh, a bit already, but I, I want to um, really spell it out for folks. There are all of these massive changes coming down from the NIH, from the OSTP, around data management and sharing, and, and the NSF as well. So, you know, in addition to these new platforms and tools, how are we communicating these changes? How are we addressing the, the, the institutional response to them? Because I know in some places, some of these changes are faced with panic and confusion. You know, where does data need to go? Um, when does something have to be released to the public? You know, how are you communicating these changes and, and helping usher it in to the, the research community at CMU? Melanie, I wonder, just because you deal with the faculty that have um, NIH grants on campus, you're probably the one who's been most deeply involved in this. Sure. Yeah. So I support all of our life science departments right now. Um, so I do get a lot of questions from faculty members who are having to um, write the new data management sharing plans. Um, and like you said, Ben, I think, um, you know, some of those questions are related to, yeah, having a lot of different repository options and not understanding where would be the best place to put their data. And I think that's especially true for you know, parts of neuroscience, which is actually my own research background as well. Like there's not often a disciplinary repository that exists for those researchers, depending on what type of neurobiology they're doing. Um, <clears throat> so especially those cases where there's not dedicated repositories, people often have a hard time, I think, navigating all of these options. And I think also just translating the policy. So I do get a lot of questions where people, you know, just want verification that they understand it accurately or confirmation of some of the jargon. So, you know, the policy is written very much in a way that we can understand it as library professionals. But I think for a lot of researchers, they're not, they're not thinking about research data management in this academic way like we are. It's like a means to an end for them. So, like, 
you know, they'll be like, is this an open format? Or I don't quite understand what they mean by <laughs> some of this. And DMP tool can be used to help translate the policy. But I think a lot of times people also just want to talk to a person if they have questions about what exactly that NIH is looking for. Um, so I have been engaged in quite a few of those conversations. And I think that we are fortunate in that we do have a lot of resources to help people share their data that we had already put in place prior to that policy change. And so I think a lot of the work in the past year has been, you know, making sure that, um, like I said, we have documentation that helps people understand what all these different options are. So like, you know, we support, you know, open science framework and our institutional repository. Um, and there are other places you can put your data. And so what will be the best place for a person um, is a big one that I've helped answer in the last year. I think the university has been doing some work to particularly around research security and NSPM to make sure that, you know, ORCID is more fully integrated into things like Workday and, and stuff like that. And then in the libraries, we are in the final stages of designing a DMSP review process, basically, where we would, as long as people get it to us a week in advance, which I know is asking a, a lot, because then they have to get it to sponsored projects a week in advance of the grant being submitted. But as long as that happens, then we can have a workflow to pair our data specialists with our subject specialists and make sure that that, that those are being reviewed as we move forward. So we're excited to, to go forward with that too. Yeah, I, I think that word workflow is really important. Um, one of the ways I think about how things are happening in terms of open at CMU is there is there are the policies that are largely external or national or global even, and how those interface with what's happening within the institution or what can happen within the institution. Cloud Labs is a great example. It's, it's a massive interface between NIH funding and the kind of research and the workflows that researchers have um, you know, within CMU. I'll, I'll mention another group, the Software Engineering Institute, which gets a good deal of funding from the Department of Defense, uh, which, by the way, has produced a memo slash policy about open source software that states explicitly, we will be open by default. Um, so it, it's very helpful to be able to say the Department of Defense said be open by default. Someone would think NIH, NSF, <laughs> others could follow. Uh, but the Software Engineering Institute has taken that and basically said, okay, what does that mean in terms of what we're doing, our research? And one example of manifestation is they have one of the most organized and well-populated GitHub, like you know, repositories of their software uh, of any group at CMU. So we we always try to find these interesting workflows, whether they're administrative in terms of research compliance, research you know, submitting grants or research lifecycle in terms of the academic work, or even teaching. Right, there's a lot of stuff that's happening around teaching and open resources, like you know, Nick had mentioned the open educational resources, for example. That's great, thank you. Um, you mentioned the kind of striking level of support for a lot of these initiatives that you've been getting from the top, which I think, as you've alluded to, isn't, isn't necessarily the case uh, at all institutions. You know, ideally, we're going to get support in different ways. But I'm wondering, you know, besides the the the, the buy-in and the the the, um, the pushes from the dean, how else are you seeing support manifest for these kinds of initiatives, and how are you advocating? for this kind of work that you're doing to be, um, to be like to drive engagement and visibility and excitement uh, around campus. So what's the support look like and how are you driving, how are you advocating? Maybe I'll jump in here. Uh, the support is not only the Dean, uh, I think it has a lot to do with Keith, but the support goes to the provost and, and the president. Uh, so I think he's been communicating, <laughs> advocating, uh, you know, for some time. And uh, an example is that there was a workshop earlier this year in January in Miami that Helios uh, organized, which was an invitational workshop for provosts, uh, vice president for some research, presidents, so on. CMU's provost went uh, to that workshop and before doing so, he asked for a briefing uh, about open science, not only at CMU, but more broadly. So we're finding that those opportunities that are more community-wide, you know, Helios being many, many institutions at this point, I, I would give you a number, but it seems like every week it's growing. Um, so that's a very powerful signal, of course, for a provost or president 
or a vice president for research that my peers are coming to a meeting to talk about this. That particular meeting was focused on, you know, the reappointment promotion tenure processes. So that's a conversation that we're also starting to try now, uh, you know, within CMU. So there are all those mechanisms that exist, you know, at other institutions through those organizations like Helios that we can we can take advantage of as well. Yeah, I think another thing that's actually been an advantage for us as well is like, I remember one time somebody asked Wajan and me how we interacted with the liaisons as the directors of open science. And the answer was that we we're also liaisons. Yeah. And so um, we, so we have really good communication with the liaisons. And, you know, like I said, like I'm out there directly interacting with all of our life science researchers daily. Um, and so I think that like also wearing those over, you know, having more than one hat really helps us connect with so many people across the university in various capacities. Um, and, you know, I think I'm always just like surprised that like, I need to reach out to somebody about open science, but I've already interacted with them some other way at Carnegie Mellon. So it's really easy to form those connections in that way. Yeah, I would, I would totally back that up. I think that um, we are a sort of in terms of FTE, a much smaller library than say the ones that either Saeed or I came from. And I think that means that everyone and the nature of CMU means that everyone has to be much more flexible and wants to be much more flexible and sort of almost like tentacular in your interest, but in a good way. I, I love cephalopods, so tentacular is good. Um, so <laughs> it feels like that... Um, really helps it, it's a small enough place that you can say oh I talked to this person yesterday and they said you were doing this in the realm of open and then you lead on to another conversation um and I think I mean we we all keep coming back to the dean like we're sort of <laughs> fan children or something but he um he has done a really good job of having that like has, having the library seen as a partner on campus and as a sort of a partner among others, as opposed to um, other institutions where I've worked at, where people are, are sort of desperately scrab scrambling for anyone on campus to pay them attention. Um, and in those cases, it can become more difficult to collaborate because people feel more of a, a, a need to own things sometimes, I think, rather than, than collaborate. So... Yeah, one one point I'll add, and I, I say this as a trained engineer, um, and I say this with some affection for engineers, but also a bit of a criticism, um, is it, it's not a, a, a superstar driven culture, right? I, I would challenge you to name me a great engineer. <laughs> you can probably name a great architect or a great physician or a great lawyer, uh, but give me give me give me a name of a really great engineer who has you know transformed society and so on. There, there are some. Right, but but it's hard to name them because by its nature, engineering is a sharing discipline. It's a team sport. When you get trained as an engineer, you're you're not told you're going to go off on your own and do something. You will be part of a team. There will be a design effort. It will be a shared process. Any complex system is going to have needs beyond your expertise. You know, no matter what kind of engineer you are, uh, think about. A building that has mechanical systems, electrical systems, electrical systems, water systems, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, and and in, CMU has a fantastic theater and design, and music and other types of programs, but it is broadly known for engineering. <laughs> so uh, I think that culture actually helps. Uh, I, I think the fact that engineers basically are taught in, in, in our education to be team players uh, and to work with, across, you know, sub-disciplines at least uh, has, has come, come through in, in a fundamental way. Yeah, if I may, I can definitely echo that. We're seeing something similar here at Case Western, especially with respect to open science framework buy-in. The engineers seem naturally primed uh, to be early adopters and, and power users of these kinds of tools, which leads us in perfectly to one of our next questions, panelists, um, because this is a Center for Open Science webinar and we are talking about OSF generally. We want to know what is the use case for the open science framework, OSF, at CMU, you know, where and how do you see it being used um, as opposed to other platforms, other repositories that might fulfill similar needs? What impacts are you seeing from its adoption and its implementation? And then also, you know, how do you see it fulfilling all of these 
open scholarship, open science uh, mandates and needs. Sure. So I'll, I can start us off here as one of our open science framework administrators. Um, so we got our license in 2018. And one of the reasons we pursued it is that we knew we already had a handful of researchers in psychology and organizational behavior using the platform. Um, and so we had talked to them as part of an evaluation process and they, you know, said that this was very valuable for them. And I think it was, you know, pretty well known in those research communities at that time. Um, and it actually turned out to be really important that we had those users because, um, you know, when we talk, when we went through all of the administrative offices that we have to go through to get approval for the license, um, the fact that we already had research groups with research data in the platform really helped us make the case with our security office who wanted to have SSO implemented. Um, so we got approval for our license. And I will say since then, we've actually really seen really dramatic growth in use of the platform. I remember kind of a funny story is when we first rolled out our license, um, we had our institutional landing page and somebody in a webinar used ours as an example and there was only like three public projects in it so it's kind of embarrassing <laughs> but our license had just rolled out like the month before but now i mean we have so many projects in there pre-registrations um, pre-registration is a big use case and i think it's been really interesting to see that also um, expand into different disciplines. Actually, um, we see it quite a bit in our CS departments and civil environmental engineering as well. Um, and, you know, Nikki talked about this intersection between evidence synthesis and open science earlier. And so um, pre-registering evidence synthesis protocols is one of the areas of support we offer through that program. And so we typically do that with open science frameworks. So that's given us an opportunity to also talk to research groups who are not familiar with pre-registration about that practice generally, but also show them how to use open science framework, which has been really nice. Um, and we also use it for a lot of events. Um, so I'll let Nikki talk more about that. Sure. Uh, yeah, so the most recent event we, we used it for was actually an AI literacy resource hackathon that we held in April. And I'm gonna just put the link in there to, to the chat. So that's the um, the project page. Basically we sort of issued an invitation and said, hey, we need to make some resources for um, AI literacy. I bet you do too. Fellow librarians come join us. And we had about, had about 35 people from about 17 different institutions who came and basically hacked together, they, they put themselves in group, they established what they wanted to work on, and then they created these series of resources that are obviously openly licensed and that anyone can can take away to, to reuse and remix. So that was just a really fun way to kind of ensure there was a lasting documentation, ensure things had their DOIs and would be recognized as scholarship um, and to support sort of the open, the openness of a hackathon with the openness of the platform. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll just add one of the conversations we're having with Cloud Lab is what is a, a set of tools? I know the term is overused, but what's what's an ecosystem of tools that we can use to support building a community around Cloud Lab? Um, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of them on Cloud Lab, but I'm fairly sure based on my conversations with them and the CMU leadership around Cloud Lab that the, the belief isn't that cloud lab will keep growing and growing and growing and become the sole platform for, for that community engagement and, and building. And there are tools out there that can be used, right? GitHub for code or, you know, OSF for various things, protocols.io, so on. So coming up with a set of what are all the research outputs and, and, and artifacts that are being produced in cloud lab, how do we want them to be shared? Who are the people that they would be shared with even beyond CMU and then mapping the tools. And I think you know, OSF, one could imagine OSF playing a role in that sort of set of tools. Absolutely. And I'm curious, um, with OSF, are you seeing, um, are, you, are you getting much movement from the humanities side of campus? Are you seeing undergraduates leveraging it effectively as well? Or is it, you know, is it specific folks that really tend to be 
power users and, and it, it doesn't leave their, their orbit much? Or how, how is it kind of spreading across the campus for you? There are some folks in, in English who are leading the sort of computational digital humanities side of things who, who are involved. And in fact, our, um, one of our STEM librarians recently held a reproducibility hackathon with one of our digital humanities professors in English, um, which I thought was really neat just to, to bring, again, that bringing that idea of open science forward. And they also used um, OSF for, for that. So it's less known for sure in the humanities. Um, and our humanities departments are much smaller <laughs> than say engineering or computer science um, or anything in the biomedical fields, but we, we're getting there one person at a time. Yeah, similar over here, thank you. Well, we are getting close to uh, the audience Q and A section of, of the, the event here, but I wanted to ask just one last little little question for the panelists here, which is, you know, in, in my experience, oftentimes these kinds of, of open scholarship, open science pushes and initiatives require a lot of cooperation and collaboration from IT, from administrative IT departments around campus. And I'm wondering, you know, from your perspective, from CMU's experience, you know, who, who needed, who needs to be uh, a stakeholder who needs to be involved in this process around campus to really help get these things off the ground that you might not, that people might not think of, you know, people like IT, you know, who needs to be involved in this process? Yeah, absolutely. I, I talked a bit, a bit about this when we were getting our OSF license, but, you know, there's um, a lot of stakeholders when you're talking about storing research data. And so for us, you know, we have um, like I said, a security office, and there's the Office of Research Integrity and Compliance, which deals with human subject data. So anything related to human subjects, we have to have conversations with them. Also, the Office of Sponsored Projects. So um, they are absolutely stakeholders for, um, you know, our Open Science Framework license, as well as all of our other platforms that hold research data. And then, like, with these, with changes in Google pricing, Data storage is, you know, a big conversation happening now at universities, and the IT units are very involved um, in those conversations. So, you know, we are starting to have um, conversations with the college IT units. It's very decentralized at current Key Mellon, so that ends up being a lot of stakeholders. But like I said, because of these liaison relationships, we often do have really good connections with those units already. Um, and actually another place that we did actually um, collaborate with our central IT on outreach was that they maintain a software catalog. Um, and up until a few years ago, that was just licenses that they owned and maintained. And we worked with them to get our research platforms in that catalog list to help improve the discoverability and visibility of these research tools to our campus users. So we got Open Science Framework on there, for example. Um, because again, I think a lot of people, you know, I, <laughs> I'm thinking back of my own research experience. A lot of people are still thinking of libraries as a place for collections, and they might not necessarily think of it as a place that is going to have a solution for storing research data. So I think it is really important to work with those units to help them, help us <laughs> let people know when they're reaching out that we also have um, platforms to help them with these things as well. I'll just add really quickly to that, that I think um, Melanie said decentralized. I mentioned fiefdoms earlier. We are definitely um, you know, a campus where maybe each of the colleges has its own little unit that's doing research support, sometimes isn't. Um, there's no graduate school, so departmental coordinators are sort of making decisions about what happens with ETDs. So there's I think the really important part for us moving forward is working out what the workflows are so that our systems can talk to other people's systems in a way that makes openness as a process or working in the open as seamless as possible for our researchers so it becomes an easy default for them. Um, but that is going to involve some sort of preferably not too Frankenstein-y um, putting together of, of systems and platforms and people. 
Yeah. And I also forgot to mention another big stakeholder for us too is the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. So they are jointly run by Carnegie Mellon and um, the University of Pittsburgh. And so that's another group that we have to talk to about all of this stuff. And I do think the Targeted Research Data Alliance is going to help again with this, get us out having these conversations with all the relevant stakeholders. Yeah, I, I'll just add quickly. Um, I, I'm on the university strategic plan update group. And um, interestingly, there's been conversations around how CMU used to be a regional university, you know, a few decades ago, sort of a Western Pennsylvania school, and how now it's a global university and we have global ambitions. I think there's recognition from leadership at every level, every division, every college, every unit, that if we want to manage that transition well and actually grow on it, we need to be more coordinated. We need to be more strategic. We need to be more intentional. Um, so I know like the vice president for research is hiring someone looking at research computing. And that person will work very closely with all the college uh, IT leadership. Um, one last point about open source software in particular is it, it's it's interesting for me like a biomarker in the sense that if you release open source into your system it'll go into all sorts of places that you may not anticipate uh, and particularly from the ospo side you know technology transfers another unit that people don't always think about right, in these conversations around open scholarship but it's important to keep them engaged even if they don't produce open scholarship um, but to not inadvertently do something where they say wait that was a commercialization opportunity why weren't we involved in the conversation even if even if it doesn't pan out it's just good to keep them involved yeah thank you i, I hope that that kind of information can be helpful for anyone in the audience who might be interested in starting these conversations themselves or struggling with getting them off the ground the way that you have so successfully well well um let's let's pivot over thank you all so much for your thoughtful contributions and discussions so far any last minute uh, info that you'd like to share, anything that we didn't get to bring up that you feel absolutely has to be represented before we do some questions? All right. Okay, well then let's open the floor for Q&As. I know we have a few already in that box there. Uh, Gretchen, please feel free yeah. to interrupt. Yeah, we can, um, we can uh, add, please, if you're in the audience and you wanna ask a question, um, put it in the, in the question um, and answer box. Um, I think we can just go through the questions that are in here and, and we can, the ones that have already been answered, we can uh, follow up on because not everybody may have had a chance to weigh in on them. So um, if you want to go ahead and start with the one that's open um, right now, Ben, we can start there. Yeah, sure. So uh, we have a question saying, do you involve statisticians? Uh, people rely on p-values. There will always be a reproducibility problem. Uh, Melanie is engaged in an answer right now, but others are welcome to chime in as well. Yeah, sorry, I was just typing, but it's faster for me to just say the answer. Um, yeah, it's a great question. So I know certainly as people have questions related to stats, we do have, like I said, good relationships with that department through our lease on Sarah Young. And so, for example, we were just working on evidence synthesis project where somebody had stats questions related to meta-analysis, and we were able to connect them with one of the faculty there who... Um, you know, gave them some feedback on the stats they were running. And I know one thing we've thought about doing is, you know, a centralized stat support service. So we have a data and code support service where we, um, people can book appointments to get help with coding and open source language and data science tools. Um, we know that, yes, a lot of universities do have a stat service and we don't have one at Carnegie Mellon. So there's been interest in that. And I would imagine if we ever did do that, that would be in partnership with the stats department. So I think, again, just assessing the need for that type of service right now. And thank you. And then we have a couple of questions that were answered. I'll go ahead and read them out in case anyone else would like to contribute or, or jump on those. Uh, we, one question is, what are some of the activities that you're doing to remove the borders between the fiefdoms? It's a real struggle to build, build collaborative working groups. Yes, de-siloing is always, always a big, big, big question. And we have a, a big answer from Saeed already. And anyone else want to jump in there? Uh, Saeed says that Cloud Lab is certainly one of the exemplars for addressing possible fiefdoms or silos. More generally, I'd note that open source software can be a more seamless way to share in an open manner, given a set of canonical licenses, engineering practices, et cetera. 
Yeah, I mean, I I think open at CMU is going to be really important for that. I mean, just in the last few months as we've started this, like noticing how much easier that is made to bridge the work of these different areas of open. And also, you know, I think we want to think more about how all of the liaisons at Carnegie Mellon can support open work. So that's not just living with a handful of us, but this is such an integral part of research. It's not really like a separate methodology. It's not a specific part of the workflow. It's it's really a, a way of doing research that applies to any discipline and any part of the workflow. So I think increasingly, you know, the hope is that this will be, um, it's like research data management, you know, like everybody will have some, you know, familiarity with it and be able to support that to some extent. And it will be, I think, um, integrated into more of our just like standard librarianship practices. Yeah. I mean, I would say for me, that's, that's been something that's been really important to me since, since I got here is to sort of say, what are, what are the suite of things that, you know, everybody needs to know enough of, like, what are the, what is it to be core of being a librarian at CMU, right? And certainly this knowledge of sort of as open as possible, as closed as necessary becomes, I think, really integral to that. And we're doing a lot of internal training to kind of not only build capacity, but build awareness and community even around those activities all this summer. Yeah. And just to piggyback on that, like I've, like we've talked about or the last year, I've gotten so many questions from my departments about the NIH policy, but we know that this is going to be rolling out to the rest of the federal yeah. funding agencies as well. So, um, you know, so people really across the disciplines are going to start getting these questions. And I think that will be a really good opportunity for us to do this. Even the humanists, they got to be ready for it. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just add that it, it, from various sources, including the National Academy's Roundtable on Aligning Incentives for Open Science, uh, which there were university presidents and provosts involved in that effort and continue to be involved in that. There, there are fairly clear signals coming out from the funding agencies and other groups in the federal government, including the White House Year of Open Science, for example, that were we're seeking more of what I had called that engineering culture, right? Sort of team-based approaches. And I, I remember one university president literally at that National Academy Roundtable saying, I don't want the superstar PI anymore. That's not a good model. Um, you know, we, we need team-based science. We need people who aren't jockeying against each other. Um, and, you know, think about that across institutions. One of the most for me, exciting things about Cloud Lab is its ability to be used by anybody with an internet connection. <laughs> Um, and that could be at any institution, any type of institution. They don't have to go out and try and build that infrastructure on their own. They can take advantage of the shared infrastructure. Uh, I think that's a really compelling model to increase participation, um, you know, the democratization of science and so on. So I, I think we're, we're, you know, we're, we're swimming downstream here. The, the, this is not something that's going away. I think what's exciting to me about that too is that it's almost, um, that sort of democratization or sharing of science, we're seeing it pop up in, you know, invest in open infrastructure and that movement. We're seeing it in, um, I think it was the Gates Foundation saying, no, you can't have APCs. You're not going to, we're not going to let you go and put $10,000 to to publish this openly anymore. A, a repository is perfectly fine. Thank you. And I think sort of that the sort of logic of that plays out, like the way that, um, author pays away works right now isn't sustainable, can't be sustainable for institutions, for libraries or for individuals. And certainly not if we want um, to have a table where people aren't just invited in, but are actually having their voices heard. And so it, it feels like a really important move forward for, for this next phase of, of a broader openness. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all so much. We are Running out of time, so I'll pass the mic back to Gretchen for the wrap up. Yeah, thanks. Um, we do have an exit poll, Teresa, if you wanna put that up there. Um, it's really helpful if you would um, fill this out. Uh, this helps us uh, on our, our webinar programming. Um, keep an eye on cos.io slash events. We have uh, webinars 
pretty frequently. Um, and we're going to be hopefully doing some more of these kinds of highlight um, case study webinars this year. So um, keep uh, keep tuned in for that. Um, I just want to thank all of our panelists today and thank our facilitator um, so much for, for doing this. It was a great conversation. Um, we will be sending out a follow-up email to all uh, attendees and, and registered um, uh, folks with the uh, recording and, and links to things once those are ready. Um, and they will also be posted to our Center for Open Science um, events page and, and YouTube um, channel eventually. So if you want to come back to this, um, you can do that and it'll have, you know, captions and all of those good things to be able to just go back and read and dig into every single little detail. Um, so thanks again so much. Thank you, everybody. And uh, have a great afternoon. And and uh, we'll see you again soon. <laughs>